Welcome back to the American College of Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Frontline Surgeons Voices. With me today, it's with immense pleasure that I introduce Professor Jackie Taylor. Professor Taylor is president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Thanks, Steve. Great to see you, Jackie, and thanks so much for taking your time. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, ask you to give a, a bit of history of, of the college. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to have this conversation with you. Our college is, um, uh, you know, a little, not completely unique because there is a, a College of Physicians and Surgeons, of course, in Canada as well. But within the UK and Great Britain, we are the only College of Physicians and Surgeons. We were founded in uh, 1599 by uh, a man called Peter Lowe, who was horrified by the standards of surgical practice as it was uh, in the city of Glasgow and, and obtained a, a royal charter from King James VI of Scotland and King James I of England uh, to set up a, a royal college. And uh, I guess the rest is, is history. Um, we're, we're very proud of our heritage. We're very proud of the fact that we bring physicians and surgeons and in fact, uh, dentists and travel medicine specialists and podiatrists all under our roof. So we're, we're truly multidisciplinary. And I think in, given the way healthcare is delivered these days by teams of people, that's a, that's a real strength for us. So uh, yeah, it's uh, lovely to have the chance to talk to you. Uh, well, the, the Royal College of Physicians of Sur and Surgeons of Glasgow certainly is ahead in, in the multidisciplinary team approach. And I, I can vouch for that fact. I'm, I'm flattered and, and, and privileged to, to be an honorary fellow and, and enjoy the people with whom I met when I was there uh, and with whom I continue to interact. Part of the rich history, though, is the fact that the college was founded, as, as you know, in 1599 and Edinburgh in 1505, and England, if memory serves correct, was somewhere around 1542, and uh, Ireland. And so you've got, you know, over 1,500 years, shall we say, amongst the four colleges of of history, and, and to my knowledge, you're the only woman who's served as president since 1599. And if I look around the other colleges, I can think of one of our uh, honorary fellows, the American College of Surgeons, uh, Dame Claire Marks, uh, who was, uh, of course, uh, president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and is now the, the GMC director. Is that really a fact that there's two women in four colleges in over 1500 years? Yeah. That, that is a fact, and uh, I, I think it's one of the things that I've been really focused on during my time as president, and I know Claire was as well, is really just trying to encourage um, people from all sorts of backgrounds to think about getting involved in college activity, because, you know, these things rely on a critical mass of people. Um, it's not just about looking at the leadership to get to to have women and people from all sorts of backgrounds, other protected characteristics, to get these people in into leadership roles requires building from the bottom up, I think, and, and encouraging and nurturing and, and promoting and really trying to give people the, the confidence as well as the skills that they need to, to think about throwing their hats in the ring. Um, so I, I think a lot of us have been focused on on doing that, on, on developing leadership programs to try and, and encourage, in particular last year, we had a, we had a focus on, on encouraging women into leadership. Um, we're looking at our equality and diversity and inclusiveness as a college across the board. So this year, our leadership program will be focused on people from other backgrounds, from ethnic minorities, from other areas where, you know, leadership has 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 less well defined you know you know what they say if you know if you can't see it you can't aspire to it so I think the visibility and and really nurturing talent is a very important part of what we should be doing as colleges very important and <clears throat> something that's being done uh, certainly here at the American College of Surgeons yes. as well as throughout the other royal colleges uh, a lot of programming, a lot of content. H have you seen the fruits of those labors begin to bear? Have you, have you start to see increase in numbers? 
I think I think we are seeing an increase in numbers. I think to be to be perfectly honest, we you know within the UK, I'm not sure about within the US, but you know, 50% of, of medical student entrants now are women. I think it's probably the same in the US. Uh, and and gradually we are seeing women going into all sorts of specialties. You know, before it was always assumed that women would go into what we call primary care or family practice. Um, now, 30 to 40 percent of female physicians, depending on specialties, consultant physicians now, not just lots in training, but consultants are now women. And that is also improving in surgical practice, but there are still some specialties within surgery, I think, where it's maybe only 10 to 15 percent. And uh, again, I, I think that does require positive action to try and just change that dynamic and and encourage women into these specialties they come into training and then sometimes leave training and we need to understand why that is and what we can do to mentor and coach and really see people through their training into consultant posts yeah, very, very important and you did touch upon the issue of, of specialty specific of, mm. On a prior program, we spoke with one of my fellow regents, Doug Wood, uh, the chief of surgery at, at the University of Washington in Seattle, a thoracic surgeon. And Doug mentioned that despite you know, significant efforts, they're still, as you just noted, hovering in the 10% uh, yeah. range or so, <clears throat> taking longer to get in there than in other uh, areas of surgery. You also mentioned the word nurturing, use the word nurturing. Mm -hmm. And nurturing may be thought of in the context of, of wellness. How do you keep people well? How do you encourage wellness? And that's been a big focus of yours. Uh, and I, I know you're, you're renowned for your work. So maybe you can speak a little bit about, firstly, wellness programs introduced during COVID-19, and then we can go on to some other aspects of wellness. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this is, the wellness well-being has been a, a real passion of mine long before COVID and uh, it was one of the things I picked as for a priority during my, my term of office and I think it was you know what really brought things home to me were some of the um, surveys and questionnaires that were being done across the UK by the GMC General Medical Council by the, the Federation of Physician Colleges of course I am a physician I have to hold my hand up and own up to that now I'm, I'm an interloper. Uh, and um, you know, some really, really, I think, worrying figures, 30% of physicians in training, given their time again, would choose a career, not just a different career, but would choose a career out with medicine. Now that to me was truly horrifying. You know, we get our brightest and best, they graduate, they come into training, and then whatever it is that we subject them to, they decide that they don't want to be physicians or surgeons anymore. And I think that's worrying. In addition to all of the concerns about burnout of, of consultants, uh, really across the board and all specialties in primary care. So we decided we really wanted to have a, a focus on well-being, And that's had a number of strands, I would say, Steve. One is, is some very basic uh, stuff, I guess, about being about lobbying, about advocating for well-being for physicians, about being persuasive to employers, to governments when they're developing their strategies, that well-being of our, our, of our medical workforce isn't about them being selfish or narcissistic. Actually, we know, we know all too well that if, if physicians and surgeons, if their well-being is high, then that translates into far better patient outcomes. So what is good for, for, the, for the staff is actually very good for the patients. Fewer clinical incidents, fewer hospital acquired infections, higher patient satisfaction, all of these things are associated with how, how well your physician or surgeon is. And I think gradually that lobbying and advocacy work has, has begun to to really help that there to be a focus on well-being for, for clinicians. So, so at one level, we've been looking at those aspects of well-being. 
Um, at another level, just within our own college, we've been, uh, you know, we've had a program of well-being webinars. We've produced a whole load of e-modules and um, a lot of signposting to resources within our own college website. So I think that's been on a practical basis, particularly during COVID, that's been really useful. And we've also been trying to encourage the development of um, nationally within Scotland, psychological support for clinicians who require it that's easily accessible and, and of a, a sort of a national workforce specialist service for the for this very small proportion of physicians and surgeons who may well actually need formal psychiatric and psychological support that, that is accessible, that is highly confidential. Um, because we know that you know, physicians and surgeons are in that hard to, re hard to reach group. They often won't go and consult their own family physician about things. So, so we've been, again, trying to ensure that those sort of confidential services are available uh, to doctors. So, so there's been, a, I guess, a number of different strands to that whole process. That, that's outstanding. It's, it's really important to be cognizant of wellness, to, to encourage wellness. Is it uh, something that's also been introduced into the medical school curriculum? Because it's, it's something you said earlier that if you can't see something, you can't necessarily aspire to it. And uh, you know, inculcating in, in people early on in their careers, how important is wellness? What are the, some avenue? What are some of the avenues open to them? What are some of the programs and resources? So, at what point do you initiate awareness and education about it? Yeah, and no, I think I think you're right. That really does need to start at an at an undergraduate level, and the medical schools, I think, are very cited on this, and are including um, a significant amount of of of, of teaching about um, not so much self preservation. That's not the right term, but really having that focus on self care. Self care, I think, is a good way to describe it. Anyway, and some of that has sadly been driven by, you know, tragedies that have occurred within undergraduates. And, um, and so that, that really has led to focus on well-being. Um, and I think, you know, if we, if we look outside medicine, um, med all universities uh, in the UK are really very focused on providing mental health services for undergraduates just because of the, uh, the concerns have been about mental health. For, for some of our, our younger uh, colleagues. And um, you know, we know that COVID has, has really shone a very bright light on some of those problems, hasn't it? The, the mental health issues and the, the well-being. And I, I hope, I'm, I'm a glass half full person, and I really do hope that one of the things that will come from um, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic will be that focus on a sustainable, approach to well-being for clinicians and that requires uh, for a lot of things there are a lot of moving pieces that requires for a lot of things to happen um, not least of which sometimes a whole cultural change within the environments that we find ourselves working in and a cultural change often requires a bit of a circular argument a cultural change often requires the right kind of leadership and a leadership that is um, that is compassionate and understanding and aware of, of some of these issues. Leadership and wellness is, is critical. Here, here yeah. at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, um, we have a chief wellness yes. officer who uh, is Dr. Mariana Barrow. She's our, our chief yeah. of staff and head of pathology and lab medicine. But she um, is, is working throughout all five, or has been working throughout all five hospitals as a chief wellness officer. Are there Fantastic. similar posts either in the college or in the universities in Scotland? Um, so there are, there are, I, I think our systems are probably not as well developed as yours are. I've been, I've been learning, looking across the Atlantic and learning from, from your own uh, centre. Uh, I know Mayo Clinic and Harvard also have similar programmes. Um, of course, we've got a slightly different structure to healthcare here. So we do have, within health boards, there are health boards being the really the employers of most physicians 
and surgeons. I'm using physician in its its broadest term um, here. Um, so there are well-being champions within those health boards now. And I think what is telling is that uh, both at UK government and at Scottish government level, there are individuals who are tasked with promoting well-being for the profession. And, and of course, you know, you need somebody to lead and drive change. And, and I, I do think there is, there is a real groundswell of um, a sort of positive feeling about the importance of well-being. I guess the tensions always come down to at service delivery level where there, there is a job to be done, there are patients to be seen, there are clinic lists and theatre lists to be completed. And sometimes I think there are at, at, at an operational level, there are tensions. And that is why I think it's so important that our organizations, our colleges, our specialist societies really do continue to, to fly the flag and highlight all the positives and the benefits. Some of which of course are around basic things like recruitment and retention of staff. You know, we live in a, uh, in the UK, we have significant workforce shortages and and it does make sense that if you want your staff to come and work with you and you want to keep them your staff and hold on to them then you have to be a good employer and to me that does mean caring genuinely caring about your staff and trying to promote what's best for them well thank you very much for your time your, your wisdom and your insights today I, I really appreciate your sharing all of these reflections with us um, any parting comments before we uh, bid adieu uh, just that it's been it's been really lovely to have been invited to to have a conversation with you Steve and uh, I'm aware of all of the great work that your college is doing across the board not 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 least of with which and its equality and diversity and leadership it's showing in that. So um, I'm grateful to have had the chance to, to have a discussion. Well, thanks so much, Jackie. And I, I look forward to meeting again in person, uh, ideally in, in Glasgow at, at your beautiful college headquarters. Well, let's hope so. You'd be most welcome. Okay, bye. Okay, good to see you. Thanks, Steve. Bye.